Um, I'd like to welcome you here tonight to the, tonight's event. It's one of the series from um, Remembering the Great War, uh, World War I Commemoration. And um, I'm Jan Wolacki. I'm the coordinator of the History Center out at National Shoe. And I'm also the secretary treasurer of the Society of Study World War II Histories. And um, co-sponsors for tonight's events include the SMSU History Club, the Society for Study of Local Visual History, and we're very happy to always um, rely on the wonderful sponsorship of the Marshall Vine County Library. So thank you, Paula, for all of your assistance in that. Um, I'm pleased to introduce tonight Anita Talsby-Gall, and she grew up in southwestern Minnesota on a farm in Marine County, to be exact. Anita left to attend school at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Then she went on to the University of Iowa, where she received her PhD in American History in 2009. Anita and her husband, Brett, moved to Marshall in 2008 to teach at SMSU. Anita's research has generally focused on local history topics. Her doctoral dissertation looked at Bishop John Ireland's Catholic colonization project in this region, focusing on the communities of Curry, Avoca, Adrian, and Ghent. Today's subject, the Women of Southwest Minnesota and the Great War began as a museum exhibit she helped to create at the Murray County Historical Museum in Slayton in 2014. From there, this project grew and expanded until it became, through the funding of a series of legacy grants, the publication we are celebrating today. And here it is. Lots of work put into this. They're available for purchase afterwards, and Anita has agreed to sign these copies if you're interested. Now that this essay has been published, she looks forward to her next legacy grant funding project. This will be with the assistance of the talented museum director, Janet Timmerman, the creation of an exciting new exhibit of four in the 1920s, which is scheduled to open at the Murray County Historical Museum in 2020. Thank you, Anita, for presenting tonight. And I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Great. All right, thank you, Jan, for that introduction. Um, first, before I start, it's important to note that this presentation and this book was made possible by the funding um, and the support from the Society for the Study of Local and Regional History. Jan Lawaji has been super helpful throughout this whole process. And through a series of four legacy grants from the Minnesota Historical Society. Legacy Grant Monday is available because we all passed that amendment, remember that, back in 20, 2006, which has made the funding for this type of stuff available. So if you voted for that amendment, pat yourself on the back. This is taxpayer money at work. So if you think this is worthwhile, yes. And if you didn't vote for the amendment, we'll let you stay anyway. Moochers. <laughs> All right, so this is your taxpayer money at worth, so I hope you think it's worth it. All right, let's talk about my outfit. What is that woman wearing? I am wearing a period costume from about 1918. This is what women in the United States were wearing um, at the time. Um, okay, I'll get up there later. Um, notice that we, are, we, have trans, uh, we have moved from the Edwardian style, which I have up there on the left, um, uh, to the World War I era. It, lo it looks like a suffragette, right? Um, you can see that uh, women's outfits have become a lot less lavish, a lot less restrictive. Um, in the United States, the Edwardian style was generally known as the Gibson girl. So it's that really poofy hair, those giant poofy hats. Um, corsets sucked really tight, so you had that hourglass figure, right? You wanted to have big bust, tiny waist, and then make your butt stick out. What happened? Come back. Okay. All right. All right. See, um, that's a movie star of the time. She was like the classic Gibson girl. Look, look at her figure. All the women in here are like, yeah, that's not natural. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's what a corset does for you. Um, if you think about how, if you've seen the 1998 Titanic, you know, there's a scene where Kate Winslet's in her room, right, and she's holding onto the post and her mom is pulling that corset tight. Yeah, that's Edwardian. Um, as we move into the World War era, um, dresses clearly have gotten a little bit more simple, um, a lot less lavish, and that's due to a number of reasons. Um, World War I era restrictions, um, the sense of austerity, and also women are doing a bit more, so we need a little bit more, uh, 
flexibility. World War I is sort of the end, is the start of the end of the corset. I do have a corset on. Now I'm going to stand up here because 75% uh, of what's going on is actually underneath this dress. So if you get wiggy, uh, I'm going to be lifting up my dress here. But you're not going to see any female nudity. I mean, what you're going to see is actually less than if I had a bathing suit on. So calm down, all right? <laughs> All right, so underneath here, first of all, I would have uh, woolen stockings going on. Um, they should be hitched to my corset with hooks. Sorry, I'm not that authentic, okay? I, I did what I could. Then I have my pantaloons. I have a camisole on underneath here. There is a corset. I don't know if you can see it. I am sucked in on a corset. Can you see it? There it is. There's my corset. Anyone getting wiggy yet? <laughs> Be like, hi, Marshall. <laughs> um, so then I have my corset. Then I have a full-length um, petticoat. From the Gibson Girl era, I've been able to shed a couple petticoats, which is really helpful because think of how red and hot I would be if I had a couple more on. All right. And then I have my dress. Um, so breathing, yeah, it's a bit restricted. Um, I tried to take small breaths. Bending over is completely impossible for me, um, so if I drop this remote, I'm going to have to ask you to pick it up because <laughs> I, can't, I can't really bend over. Um, but due to metal shortages during World War I, corsets started to, to go out and women were going corsetless. Because women no longer had corsets to hold themselves up, guess what was patented in 1914? The bra. So if you're like, I like not having to wear a corset and just having to wear a bra, think World War I, uh, uh, okay? Um, it's not that all women stopped wearing a corset. Corsets, you know, women would still wear that, but World War II was pretty much the death knell for corsets um, because, again, because of metal shortages. So that's kind of exciting. And if you thought, wow, you woke up this morning, like what is the history of women's undergarments? There you go, you just got some. <laughs> So, so this is period costume. Um, notice too that uh, dress, you can't see the bottom of this, but dress lengths are shortening. Um, they would show the ankle. Um, that happened around 1915, and because there was an outcry of, oh, how immodest, those slutty women showing their ankles, uh, <laughs> dress lengths did go back down by 1918. So you see that mine has gone back down. Um, we generally wore boots underneath them because you couldn't see our shoes anyway because our dresses went to the ground. Um, once dress lengths start going up, shoes start to matter because people can see your shoes. So once, you know, think flapper era, think those fun, you know, Mary Jane, whoo! Let's not get crippled by you. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, then shoes start to matter, but because my dress goes to the ground, uh, I just got on my sturdy boots. All right. And in case you're wondering, where does Anita get all these awesome costumes? No, I don't actually own them. Um, this costume is courtesy of Sheila Tabaka, who works at the SMSU Theater Department. Um, she custom made this dress for her own World War I presentation a couple years ago. And she is gracious enough to let me borrow it along with all the undergarments. I do not actually own a corset. Um, and if you're thinking, wow, I would like to see more of Sheila Tabaka's work, you are in luck because she is directing the spring production at SMSU of Awesome 80s Prom. And if you also thought, wow, I would love to see Anita in 80s wear, you know, think shoulder pads, big hair with the blown out bangs and the big wings on the side held together with a lot of Aquanet, I will also be in that production. So if you want to see me in 80s wear, um, it's interactive theater, so if you've ever been to Tony and Tina's wedding, you are part of the prom, so come to prom the second and third weekend of April. It will be really fun. So, all right, enough about that. All right, let's talk about the women of Southwest Minnesota and the Great War. First of all, let's define what we're talking about when we say Southwest Minnesota. According to the Society for the Study of Local and Regional History, this is the 19 county region that comprises Southwest Minnesota. This is the in case, so if you're ever wondering, I know you're going to quibble like, really? Martin County, Wattenwan County, I don't know. But I didn't make the rules. I just live by them. This is the official definition. Now, I looked at what, not what women throughout the United States were doing. I didn't even look at what women throughout the state of Minnesota were doing. I looked at what women in this region were doing. And to be perfectly honest, I particularly looked at 
five counties more in depth than other counties. I looked at Rock County down there in the corner. Um, Laverne is the capital of uh, this county seat. I looked at Pipestone County. I looked at Murray County because I'm from Murray County and it started in Murray County. So I looked at Murray County. I also looked, looked at Lyon County because that's where I live now and Cottonwood County. So those are the five that I looked at a little bit more in depth than the other uh, 14. Now, if you are here as a student for extra credit or as a requirement, and, you, and your teacher asks you, what was the topic of her talk? Right here, here's the thesis. <laughs> so write that down. <laughs> There's the thesis. <laughs> All right. In my research, I found that the women of Southwest Minnesota overwhelmingly supported World War I, and that's what I could find in the sources. Does this mean that every woman who lived in this area was like, Woo! World War I, yeah! <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe there was a lot of talk going on at home. Maybe there were doubts and thoughts inside women that just not get expressed. World War I was not a time to be exercising your First Amendment rights. It was generally not conducive to free speech, um, not only within the United States, but particularly in the state of Minnesota. We created the Commission of Public Safety just a couple days after the war, whose job it was to ensure support of the war and to crack down on disloyalty. And boy, they were busy cracking down on disloyalty writ large. Um, to give an example of what was considered disloyalty during the war, my own great grandfather, Henry Maslink from Edgerton, Minnesota, was in the barber shop during the war. And a young man comes in, this is the story that's been passed down to me. A young guy comes into the barber shop while my great grandfather was in there and he says, I've just been drafted. I have to go to war. My great grandfather says, I don't think that's right. You got two young kids at home. For that, my great grandfather was reported to the Murray County Commission of Public Safety. He was hauled in, he was questioned, he was forced, he was persuaded to uh, sign an oath of loyalty, and he was persuaded to make a generous donation to the Red Cross. That was disloyalty in World War I. So, so was everybody perfectly on board with World War I? No, but did you talk about it a whole lot? No. So what my sources, what I could find in my sources is that women generally supported World War I from the, in this area. And they did so in mostly ways that adhered to traditional gender roles, their roles as mother, as caregiver, as homemaker, as wife. And this meant by preserving and conserving food, by volunteering for Red Cross work, working as nurses. But there were some women who used the opportunity that wartime opened for them and decided to push a little bit into roles and into occupations that had generally been reserved for men. And we will talk about what some of those were as we go on. And they also increased their participation in public life. But hold on, we'll get to that in a second. You're like, how, 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 we're coming. All right, so how did women support the war effort? One of the first things that women um, did was to support the food conservation campaign launched by the United States Food Administration. Right after war was declared, we created a food administration to help us conserve food, produce more food, because now we not only had to feed the al we had to feed our troops, we had to feed the allies too. We're in this war, we gotta feed the troops. So back home, it meant we had to ma make more, raise more food, produce more food uh, to send over. So Herbert Hoover, you're like, I've heard that name before. Yeah, he's gonna be president down the road, but he's not president yet. He's just Herbert Hoover, private citizen, right? Um, so he has the U.S. Food Administration, and there were no rations um, passed during World War I. Way towards the tail end of the war, there was a little bit of sugar rationing, but mostly it was just through persuasion. Get Americans to preserve more food so that we can send them to the troops. So they went on a huge propaganda effort and started cheering out the posters to convince us that we needed to get on board and help with the food conservation campaign. So there's, the food will win the war. Save wheat, meat, fats, and sugar, and those were the four things you were really supposed to cut down on, because that's what the troops needed. And they would tailor their posters to any demographic. So look at the middle one, clearly aimed towards immigrants. Food will win the war. You came here seeking freedom. You must now help to preserve it. Wheat is needed for the allies. Waste nothing. And here's one for the kids. I think I have a button here. Yep. Kids, little Americans, do your bit. Eat cornmeal mush. <coughs> mm. 
because if there's nothing that's tastier than cornmeal mush. Oh, yeah, I can hardly get my kids to eat oatmeal. All right. But anyway, eat cornmeal mush. Support the troops, right? Um, in, in Minnesota, we created our own food committee, and we actually beat the feds to the punch. Yeah, we're awesome. Um, and we put the head, or the extension director, University of Minnesota extension director, A.D. Wilson, in charge of it. And he had four goals here in Minnesota. We are going to increase production. That meant farmers raise more, but that meant everybody. Plant a garden, raise some chickens, grow some pigs, right? Raise some pigs, we don't grow pigs, okay? <laughs> Whatever. Farm girl talking about growing pigs, all right. <laughs> Uh, limit consumption, change your cooking and eating habits, and eliminate waste. <laughs> so they would have like here from the state fair already in 1970s. In 1917, they're having food camps. Yeah, because I go to the state fair to go to a food camp. All right, and here's bread making demonstrations. These girls are going to show us how to make war bread. Talk about that in a minute. Um, the extension, the food committee also hired women to go out throughout the state. The whole state was divided into regions, and these women would come and they would be the district agents, and they would conduct classes throughout that region on canning, on gardening, on preserving food, on making war bread. Um, so they would be assigned to a district. Here in Southwest Minnesota, we had two successive ones, Ora Conley and Susan Howe. They were both young University of Minnesota graduates, and they would be down here stationed down here and these women were busy they were not sitting in their office doing paperwork for a couple months they were in Tracy one night and then they were in Jasper and then they were in Minnesota and then they were in Edgerton and then they were in their Ellsworth these women were all over the place doing all kinds of classes mostly attended by women but sometimes men as well so these women were going around helping with the food conservation campaign um, everyone was in, uh, encouraged to cut down on the wheat, so they would develop war bread recipes. Now, there's no one standard war bread recipe. There's not even a standard of how much less white flour you had to use to be considered war bread. One article I read said, well, it had to use less than 80% white flour. Another one said less than 50%. Whatever. The idea is to use less white flour, substitute rye flour, barley flour, potato flour, cornmeal, right? So here's an example I found in a local newspaper of cornmeal yeast bread. So I took out all the white flour and just used cornmeal. Here you go, let potatoes fight. They save wheat. When you eat potatoes, don't eat bread, right? And here by the end of the war, this is what the Food Administration was recommending everybody should be eating to conserve food. Sunday, one wheatless meal and a meatless meal. Monday, all meals wheatless, one meal meatless. Do you see how much we were supposed to change our eating habits? I mean, if you look at this, um, basically there are only three meals in a week where there are no restrictions. Again, this wasn't required, but this was encouraged. So this is one way that women in our area of the country participated. They would also go around with pledge cards. Like, women would actually come knocking at your door, like, have you signed the pledge card? What are you going to say? No. Watch me eat a steak. Right. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, this is a pledge card that you would uh, supposedly would get sent to Mr. Hoover um, saying that, yes, I participate in the food conservation campaign and, and I will save the food. Uh, and, who, and who can turn down that woman? Like, she's like, come on, be patriotic, sign the pledge card. <laughs> Come on, Lady Liberty wants you to do it. All right, so around here you do see most women are participating in the food campaign. Another way that women supported the war effort is by joining the Red Cross. And people join, and not just women, people in this area join the Red Cross in droves. Um, here's an example. In Pipestone County, by the end of the war, had 13 Red Cross chapters. 4,600 members, which is about 50% of the whole county's population, belong to the Red Cross. Same is true in Murray County. They had 11 chapters, but also about 50% of their entire population belong to the Red Cross. And it's interesting that most of these local Red Cross chapters were organized and started and shared by women. So Nellie Reeder, who was of Pipestone County, it's not unusual that women are in the leadership positions of the Red Cross. What kinds of stuff did the Red Cross do? Well, they did a lot of fundraising. 
I swear, every week there was a fundraiser. It must have gotten very fatiguing to be constantly asked. Um, but they would have constant fundraisers to, because the Red Cross would support canteens for the troops, hospitals for the troops, nurse training for the Red Cross nurses, staffing the hospitals. They were very active in the war effort. And so here's an example of the over-the-top parade. Yes, that term comes from World War I, over-the-top. Um, this was held in May 1918. These are pictures from Slayton's Red Cross Parade. Um, somebody pointed this out to me a couple presentations ago. Look, there's actually, they're in the shape of a cross. I know, I never noticed that before. It wasn't in color, but there you go. Um, and here was the winning float of the Slayton 1918 Red Cross Parade. It was the Fulda float. So if you're from Fulda, I know you're just beaming with pride. Um, that was the winning float. But if you read it, it's actually, it's, I don't know, it's kind of sad. So there's a coffin right there, draped with a flag. And on the side it says, he offered his life for you. Now how, what will you do for him? Not charity, but duty. Okay, people, time to support the Red Cross. <laughs> yeah, he's dying for you. What are you doing for him? All right. Um, what else did the Red Cross do um, for fundraising? They would do all kinds of things. Here they would have a concert. They did that in Laverne. <coughs> Here the ladies of Lake Wilson would have chain luncheons. So like 10 ladies would have, or a lady would have 10 ladies over and they would each pay a quarter to eat lunch at her house. That money would be given to the Red Cross and then those 10 ladies had to host a luncheon and invite 10 more and so you see a chain luncheon as a fundraiser. They would have picnics. And in case you're wondering, what do they eat at a picnic during World War I? Uh, buns and universe, universe, you know, hot dogs, hot dogs. Ham sandwiches, baked beans, potato salad, pickles, donuts, coffee, ice cream, donuts. Well, it's nice to know some things never change, right? <laughs> Isn't that pretty much what we eat at picnics now? The prices have changed a bit. Hot dog is 10 cents, but everything else is 5 cents. So for a dollar, you could have, you know, two people have a full meal, including donuts. I'm sure those were not high V donuts. I bet those were homemade. <laughs> mm. um, all right. And it was specifically noted in all of these that women organized these fundraisers. The article specifically noted that, so I highlighted them here. Um, another thing they did was they packed care packages for the troops, and they were called comfort kits. I love this clipping from the Slayton Gazette because you gotta read it. Okay, I'll read it to you. All right, the Slayton Red Cross chapter sent out 75 bags to headquarters to be sent to the soldier boys. Each package contained envelopes, tobacco, cigarette paper, um, Hershey's, mint candy, whorehound candy, which is a hard candy, uh, sweet chocolate, lemon drops, cough drops. The young lady members enclosed their names and addresses. <laughs> Not call me. Right. <laughs> you like this? Yeah. <laughs> and the next paragraph is awesome, too. The people of Hadley had a dance and entertainment a short time ago, and with the proceeds sent a big supply of tobacco to each of the Murray County boys they know to be in France. The packages were sent on Wednesday of last week, and each boy received 800 cigarettes and a package of candy. <laughs> Hadley will certainly be popular in France. Yes, Nick, Hadley will. <laughs> Imagine that, like, hey, you just got the 800 cigarettes. My have times changed. <laughs> yeah. All right, so they would pack care packages, but the number one thing the Red Cross did was knit, 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 knit. Um, this was a slogan, our boys need socks, knit your bits. You're gonna hear that all the time here. Women should do their bit, especially knit their bit. Um, so they would every week in most towns would have um, places where you could come in town and you were supposed to knit. You would knit socks, you would knit scarves, you would knit sweaters. Here's are some of the things when we did our exhibit at the Murray County Museum. These are things that Murray County women actually uh, knitted. Um, and so they would have every county had a quota set by state Red Cross headquarters of how much they had to knit. And it was a lot. Um, let me just check here. I've got it written down. I don't remember these statistics off my head. All right. Murray County sock quota. 675 pairs of socks per month. 
And that's not counting all the sweaters, all the scarves, all the bed sheets, all the, there was something called helpless case bed shirts. Oh man, if you gotta be wearing a helpless case bed shirt, things are looking bad for you. Okay, but um, Pipestone County's quota, 850 pairs of socks per month. Do you see why the pressure to knit, 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 knit is really intense on these women? Please help us knit, please help us knit. They've got quotas to meet. Um, and to help uh, encourage women to show up to knit, um, they would often post in the newspaper the stats for how much each uh, local chapter was getting knit. So every month it was like, okay, how much of Boca? And this is actually a four month total. So you can see in Avoca, the women of Avoca in the past four months have gotten eight sweaters, 16 mufflers, 25 pairs of socks, and 14 wristlets done. But these slackers in Current Lake, <laughs> three sweaters, six mufflers, 17 pairs of socks. What are these women doing? Sitting around gossiping? Like, mm. uh, but clearly, um, you get a sense that there might be a little public shaming going on. Like, okay, what's wrong with you women? Why aren't you getting your knitting done? Um, and there was intense social pressure to get on board and start helping with the Red Cross, whether it was knitting or belonging or giving money. So these editorials would show up, started showing up in the newspaper all the time. Ladies, we need more knitters. Where are you knitters? Nobody's showing up for the knitting sessions. Um, also, look, look at this. This was in the Lake Wilson newspaper. A list of the Red Cross members in Lake Wilson will be found posted in the lobby of the post office of Lake Wilson. Everyone interested should give this list careful scrutiny and be sure that their name is enrolled thereupon. You see what this also does? You can also go to that list and you can say, Eric. Eric, why aren't you on this list? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you support the war? <laughs> okay, pretend it was in Marshall. Okay, all right. Are you disloyal? Don't you care about America? Right, so you can see where the sense of public pressure to join the Red Cross is pretty intense. Um, you also get um, editors writing editorials like the following, which ran in May, uh, 1918 in the Edgerton Enterprise. If women of this community do not respond more readily and faithfully to the call for Red Cross workers, it may be necessary to draft them. There is no reason why the men should be forced to serve in the army while the women at home act at their pleasure. The condition of the kitchen floor or the family silverware is not of consequence compared with the welfare of the boys at the battlefront. And the Kaiser would not stop for a clean floor, burnished silverware, or fancy embroidery on your collar if he and his hordes of Huns got over here. A soldier who is poorly nursed or cared for is worse than no soldier at all. And the Red Cross must see that our soldiers are kept in the best of condition. Many of our women are working faithfully, but others with no greater handicaps at home are doing little or nothing. <laughs> you slacker women, get to work. We need socks. Okay. Every once in a while, I would find a little bit of pushback. Not often. Uh, this uh, this little editorial um, from my very favorite newspaper editor, Gunnar Bjornsson, over there in Minneota. <laughs> Uh, he wrote a little editorial about how, you know, all these city women come down here and show us these fancy cooking classes, you know, but we country women, or not we country women, but the country women down here, you know, they know how to do all this. They've been gardening, they've been conserving, they've been preserving for a long time. So, you know, you think you're coming down here, you fancy city folk, you're not really teaching us anything. This one also makes me laugh. This was in the Lyon County News Messenger. A woman has suggested that the men do their bit with one smokeless day each week. Another plan is for the smoker to lay aside every other cigar or its equivalent and send tobacco to the soldiers in France. You know, we're supposed to do our bit, do our bit, do our bit, conserve. Maybe the men can do a little too. Just an idea, all right. 
some, not many, local women uh, did enlist as nurses. And these were mostly young women, single women, and women with some education. So these were not you know, farm girls generally. These were generally part of the upper middle class elite of our small towns. Um, and some of the women that I found who went off were Ava McEwen from Pipestone. Uh, she went off and joined the US Navy Nurse Corps. She never was sent to France, but she served at the uh, Navy and Marine Recreation Hospital in Philadelphia. And she would write letters back home to Pipestone and they would publish them um, in the Pipestone newspaper. And she would generally report on what she was doing and what kind of stuff. And one of them, towards the end of the war, she was really exasperated um, because the men in her, in her ward kept coming in drunk. And so they wouldn't stand at orders for attention and she was really frustrated because women in whatever they enlisted in, they were given no rank. So they really did not have the authority um, to make people do anything that they wanted them to do. So she, was, she expressed a bit of frustration uh, with the, the patients that she was taking care of. Um, another pair of women from our area who went off to become nurses are Emma and Elsie Harmson, both from Lake Wilson. Uh, Emma joined the Army Nurse Corps and she was stationed stateside at a military base at Camp Lewis, Washington. But her sister Elsie actually joined the Red Cross and she was sent over to France and she would work in a, she worked in a series of evacuation hospitals. And these were the hospitals directly behind the front lines. So the very first wave of injured soldiers would be brought into these hospitals to be stabilized and then uh, shipped to hospitals farther back. But she was on the surgical team. Well, that's bad. I'll be right back with a replacement. Fill out your. Okay. <laughs> sometimes it comes back on it and sometimes And it sometimes doesn't. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, she, um, she was uh, on the surgical team. And she, when I was doing the research for this, I found a whole treasure trove of documents um, from the veterans office in Murray County. And they had actual letters written by soldiers and they also had a document where she wrote down everything she had done as a Red Cross nurse during World War I. And that's how I know what she did and she reported that when she was working in these evacuation hospitals, um, what she would usually be working on is men who had been gassed. So she was dealing with the trauma of all of that, the men who are coming off the front lines and she would have to you know, work in triage and stabilize them so that they could get shipped back. Um, another nurse that was featured, if you could see her, uh, was from Rock County. Her name was Fivey Ray Horn. And she, was in, she enlisted in October of 1918. She was sent, da sent down to um, Camp Funston in Kansas. And she died 10 days later. You say, what happened? Five Ray Horn was one of the victims of not the Spanish influenza, right, Dr. Zarzana? Right? <laughs> not the Spanish. If you saw Dr. Zarzana's talk, you will never call it the Spanish influenza again. Epidemic. It was the great influenza pandemic of 1918, and she was one of the victims of it. Interestingly enough, that camp was is suspected of possibly being one of the sources of the great influenza. Um, and that is where she was shipped down to for training. Um, she contracted the disease almost immediately upon arrival. Her, and she, got, she deteriorated very quickly so that the day before, um, actually, her parents were summoned. Her mother came down from Laverne and was there when her daughter passed away the very next day. So she died on October 28, 1918. Her body was brought back to Laverne and she was buried at a funeral of full military honors. So that's what happened to Fivey Ray. But there were only 278 women who died in service in World War I. Fivey Ray was one of them, all of whom died of disease. Um, so she has that, I don't want to say honor, but she has you know, that notoriety, I guess. Um, and the final one that I was going to note is Myrtle Hollow. She was from, Rock, uh, from Lyon County here. She was from Marshall. She joined the Red Cross. And she also was shipped over to France towards the end of the war. She was shipped over and her hospital actually wasn't finished yet, so she got to be a tourist around France for a while. And she would write back to, and report and the newspaper would publish her letters. And she would be like, wow, I went to a really interesting farmer's market and I saw a movie and I went out to eat. And, and so she had 
I don't want to say had fun, but she would be doing things sort of more as a tourist before her hospital was ready, and then she got um, assigned to her hospital and started to work. So that there were women all over, from all over our region who would be uh, enlisting as nurses. But there was also women who did other things and decided to challenge traditional gender roles a little bit more. And the first thing uh, that they did is they started doing things like being store clerks and stenographers and working in stores and doing things like that. <laughs> but you also see them doing things like bookkeeping. Um, do you want me to stop a minute? <laughs> no? Great. Okay. Great. All right. When I don't have my PowerPoints, it's a little bit more difficult. All right. Um, and so even in Laverne, there was a woman employed as a, as a lumber yard employee. And there was a woman who reported that a woman had taken the job. And she said, wow, they've never hired a woman at the lumber yard before. But she's only here until they can find a man to do the job. So, so it wasn't like they were happy about hiring women. But because of the shortage of male workers, um, women were able to move into occupations like that. There is also an example in uh, Minneota where there was a woman, women were becoming bookkeepers um, and stuff like that. Okay, this must happen often, Paula. Oh, I'm sorry to say it occasionally does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here again is a little editorial from our favorite newspaper editor, Gunnar Bjornsson, over in Minneota. Um, in July of 1918, he wrote, all over the country, the war is developing business women. These women are taking the place of men and are doing it with skill and efficiency. This was brought to our attention the other day when a young lady stepped into our office and in a very businesslike manner presented a bill for a local firm. This young lady has been doing the monthly reading of the electric meters for several months. Also, she has been collecting bills and keeping books. She is just a high school girl, but she goes after the business she is assigned to like a veteran. She and many others like her all over the country are doing their bit, doing their bit to help in this war, and their bit is by no means a small matter. The war is going to give us a businesswoman of a highly developed type, and many a man will have to look to his laurels when it comes to keeping pace with these soon-to-be competitors in the field of occupation and industry. Well, who would have thunk it? <laughs> Women can keep books, too. <laughs> it's a revelation for Gunnar Bjornsson, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you also see women um, becoming railroad workers. It was specifically noted in Jasper and Ruthton that the night operators at the depot, um, women took those jobs. Uh, I love this little quote here. So you have women at Jasper, at Ruthton, and at Clara City. We like it fine, the girls wrote home. We never knew before what it meant to be a railroader. Many girls are on the job all along the line, some wearing overalls and working side by side with men. No more of this get up, yeah. <laughs> um, you also see women going out into the field more often. In the harvest of 1917, they would have articles in the paper encouraging women like, you're gonna need to help the farm wives cook all the food for the threshers this, week, this year. By 1918, they're like, you women are going to have to get out and go in the fields. Yeah. <laughs> so they were encouraging women to go out and help with the field work, and women did. Um, you would find examples of women forming shock troops and going from the city and from the towns and going out to help the farmers. You say, I don't know what a shock troop is. Let me talk. All right. So most of the grain uh, were small grains, and so like the, the wheat and the oats, uh, you would have to cut them, and then someone would have to come through and gather them into bundles, which were called shocks. And so this was heavy intensive work where you had to grab all these pokey, pokey stalks of oats, and you had to tie them together, and then they would pile them up into these giant piles. Then the threshing crew would come and run them through the thresher. So women were going out forming shock troops and going out and helping to bundle all of those, put them into bundles, and then stack them on piles for the threshing crew. Um, I thought this was a really interesting picture because very rarely do you find pictures of women out in the fields. And you can see that there is clearly a woman standing in front of that oat stack right there. Now I know, I know, someone said to me, she's just bringing lunch. She's got gloves on. 
So that might suggest she was actually shocking. So <laughs> um, I love, um, there's also examples of women who are helping with the hang. And this was from near Island. Island is on Highway 23 as you go towards Sioux Falls. So here's what the Pipestone County Star reported. The crops will go to waste this fall for the want of help if all the women turn out and do as one of our patriotic sisters is doing during haying. Hitches up the rake herself, and not only hitches up, but climbs on and drives the rake in the hay field. Hurrah from the women who are doing their bit to help win the war. Yes, so you do see examples of women going out more often um, and helping with shocking grain. The most interesting example I ran across happened in Pipestone County, in the town of Woodstock. And in the town of Woodstock, this woman, Bessie Hardigan, took the initiative to form a home guard, an all-female home guard. You say, what's a home guard? Well, during World War I, all the National Guard units of the area towns were called up to serve in the regular army. So the home guard was formed of basically the leftovers, <laughs> the men who were still around, and they would basically serve as the National Guard units around here. They would help in emergencies. They'd be ready in case of attack. Um, there were 23 home guard units in the state of Minnesota. Bessie formed an all-female home guard unit. It was never recognized as an official unit by the state of Minnesota, so it was unofficial. But she took the initiative to form this, and as you see, this is a picture of the Woodstock Guards of Loyalty, they were called. They had uniforms, they had real rifles, which all the articles noted, women parading around with rifles, um, and they would do military-style drills. <coughs> This was a picture on July 4th in front of the Pipestone County Courthouse. This is when they basically burst onto the scene and they appeared at their Independence Day celebration in Pipestone, which the governor of Minnesota happened to be at. So the city's press picked up on this and it was reported even in the Twin Cities papers that down here the women are super patriotic and they are forming military units. Um, very little is known about this. They existed for a very brief time. Um, they dissolved shortly after the war ended. Um, Bessie was the organizer. She was a 42-year-old milliner, uh, so she ran the hat shop in Woodstock. Um, in the course of my research, I came across a woman whose mother and grandmother served in the Guards of Loyalty. And she, re she grew up in Woodstock, and she remembered Bessie Hardigan when she was a little girl and Bessie was an old, older woman. And I said, tell me about Bessie. What kind of woman was Bessie? She paused and she said, you know, Bessie was the type of woman that when she asked you to do something, you didn't say no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Bessie standing right in front. Um, so her skills as a milliner probably served her well here, which might explain why they all have matching uniforms. She had access to that kind of stuff. Um, but Unfortunately, all copies of the Woodstock newspaper have been lost, and there are no microphones. So any more details have been lost to history. So if any of you are cleaning out your great aunt's attic someday, and you come across old copies of the Woodstock <laughs> newspaper, please save them and donate them to your local historical society as soon as possible. OK, thank you. All right. Um, so there's an example of women moving into occupations traditionally held by men. They also would do things more in the public life. So you see women going out and giving lectures, um, giving lectures for the YWCA. Uh, Grace Mann, who was the assistant principal at Ballotton High School, would give lectures on woman's part in the war. Winifred Bartlett, secretary of the Pipestone County Red Cross, um, would give instructive and inspiring talks to the Edgerton Red Cross members who clearly needed it. <laughs> so I hope it was really inspiring, because those Edgerton ladies were not doing their bit at all. Um, so you would have women who would do more public speaking. Uh, you would have women chairing committees. They formed entire women's committees for the Liberty Loan campaigns to get people to buy war bonds, to buy savings stamps, to support the war efforts. <laughs> These are the chairs of the Rock County Liberty Loan campaigns. They even made special posters. So, Joan of Arc saved France. You can save America by war saving stamps. Yes, yes. Um, as I noted before, women also did fundraisers. These were two interesting ones. The women of Lyon County liked to push the boundaries a little bit when they did fundraisers. Um, so in April 1918, 
The ladies of the Lyon County Red Cross put on a ladies minstrel show. In case you're wondering, what is a minstrel show? A minstrel show is when white people paint their faces black and act like African Americans, but not in a very flattering way. In a way that made them look stupid and hokey and jolly and, and it was not a flattering depiction, but this was considered acceptable comedy back in the day and this was women doing it, women donning blackface and doing a minstrel show. You also have women in Lyon County pushing the gender boundaries. Um, so in 1918, they held a dance, a Red Cross dance. A unique feature of the occasion was that all the attendants were young women, but half of them played the part of gentlemen. So here was an opportunity for women to cross-dress, to dress as guys, either as soldiers or in a tux, and they would be the men, and the other half of the women would come as the ladies. So if you think pushing gender boundaries is something new, no, no, they were doing it 100 years ago too. So the women were using the war as an opportunity to sort of push the boundaries a little bit of what was acceptable female behavior. So in the end, we all know, or maybe we don't, newsflash, um, the World War I ended uh, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, which was November, 11 o'clock a.m. on November 8, 11, 1918, which became known as Armistice Day, which then became known as, what is November 11th? Day. Veterans Day, very good. I can see your history classes are really paying off for you. All right, so after Armistice Day, you sit back and you think, well, okay, what was the impact of the war on women? Did this have any effect? Well, on the one hand, women gained the right to vote one year later, 19th Amendment to the Constitution in 1920. Was it a result of the war? Did people step back and say, you know what, women have done their bit for the war, maybe they deserve suffrage? Maybe if they can you know, handle in an evacuation hospital working on a surgical team next to the doctor, maybe they can handle the vote. So on the one hand, you know, maybe it pushed female suffrage earlier than it would have. But on the other hand, any advances women made into occupations or roles traditionally held by men did not extend after the war. When the soldier boys came home, Ladies, time to go back to the kitchen. Those are the jobs for our men, like in the lumber yard. We're only hiring a woman until we can find a man. So any gains they made in that field uh, were quickly lost. And again, we don't see women really entering the workforce too much again until, oh yeah, the other war coming down the pike, World War II. So on the one hand, you could say, well, maybe they gained stuff, maybe they didn't. But in the end, that's, you know, it's questionable what the war's overall effect was on women. So, do, does anyone have any questions for me? Whew. I tell you, corsets are hot. Yes, sir. I've heard that the German populations were around here were kind of isolated at times, and all that social pressure that they're using for to get into the Red Cross. Did you see that any of that coming to do, or where certain communities can't participate? Um, the anti-German sentiment was pretty high around here. Um, I ran across a number of examples of people who were even suspected of being German sympathizers. Their businesses or their cars or their homes were splashed with yellow paint in the night um, by vigilante groups. So they'd wake up and yellow was the sign of cowardice. Um, the last known tarred and feathering actually happened in Rock County by Laverne during World War I. A German-American farmer had, been, had refused to buy a Liberty bond, and in the night his neighbors came, hauled him out of his house, beat him up, tarred and feathered him, <laughs> drove him to the South Dakota border, and dropped him off and said, don't come back. John Mintz was his name, the last documented tarred and feathering in American history. He sued. He had pictures. He sued. He lost. The judge, of, the judge found he had been disloyal. <laughs> so anti-German sentiment was really high in this area. Um, and even if um, the people in Edgerton were Dutch, and they spoke, a lot of them spoke Dutch yet, well, Dutch, German, it all sounds the same, right? <laughs> and they actually experienced some too, because people just didn't know better. But yeah, it wasn't a good idea to be German. Oh, here's another, in Minneota, someone broke into the public school at night in 1918 and burned all the German language textbooks. So. 
being German wasn't a positive during World War I, particularly in this area. I don't know. Dr. Coleman. Dr. Coleman. <laughs> Suffrage activity? Did you encounter any? The only, there was a suffrage league in Pipestone, and the suffrage league spearheaded the formation of many uh, of the Red Cross chapter in Pipestone County. So it, it seems like people who were active in the suffrage movement were also active in like the Red Cross and stuff. That's the only mention I ever came across of suffrage activity uh, in this area. Women active in the committees for public safety? And no, I did not. I didn't see any reports of women hauled up in front of the Committee of Public Safety. The only thing I found is in Rock County again, I don't know what it is about Rock County, but one woman uh, called her father in law out for charges of disloyalty and had him hauled up in front of the Committee of Public Safety. <laughs> now, it was also noted that. They lived in the same house. <laughs> I'm guessing there's a whole lot more to that story that was not reported in the paper when you're calling out your father-in-law for disloyalty. <laughs> but no, I didn't find much activity by women in these committees at all. Yes, sir. So did the Red Cross collect any blood? No, not at this time. They weren't collecting blood. They were collecting money. <laughs> Money, yeah, I didn't see any. And it wasn't just money, they would have uh, leather drives, they would have book drives, they would have tobacco drives, you know. You can just donate cigarettes for the boys at the front. Um, they would have treasure and trinket drives, so you could give your old like jewelry and they would melt it down and send it. They had clothing drives for the re relief of the poor Belgians and, and they would have all kinds of stuff, but I'd never found evidence of a blood drive. I don't think they had figured out a way to preserve blood yet until World War II. So I don't think they're doing transfusions and stuff until Yeah, I don't I don't think that's really even possible yet. Our medical technology isn't there. We're not there. We're dealing with the influenza. Yeah. Yes, sir. Were there German uh, prisoner camps in Minnesota German camps? Yes, there was a lot of them. Oh, Nick, help me out in Minnesota history class. Sorry. Although Minnesota had one. I want to say there's there was like 12, 13 of them. There was quite a few German POW camps, but that was during World War II, but not during World War I. There's one in New Orleans, because um, my dad, I grew up by Morgan, and he had prisoner of wars come out to help on the farm oh. that were German. Okay. I've also heard that a number of the German POWs in Minnesota camps just after the war decided to stay here. Well, they conversed you know? with them many years sure. after. Okay. From 20, 30 years late after he went back. Right. Convenient that they were buying New Ulm. Lots of people to converse with, yeah. But that means he wrote a letter asking for money because German, Germany after World War II was so devastated, such poverty, that they had nothing. And that's what he asked for, was money to buy food. Because they had nothing. Did he send them money? I don't know. Oh. My grandfather. <laughs> Your grandfather. I'd be curious to know. But they probably did because he I did would, that sort of thing. I would guess so. I would guess so. Doctors on hand. Well, Hoover, you know, you had the picture up there. After the war, he is the American representative to feed refugees and has a huge humanitarian role. And as president, his attitude was that strict laissez-faire, government should not get involved. And you know, he thought he was doing the right thing and right. contributed to making the depression worse by doing nothing. But I mean, from, from this side of, of history, we think of them as you know the, the Great Depression <laughs> earlier in right. history was quite humanitarian. He was, and he was very successful in doing it. He was a top-notch organizer. I mean, that's how he got to be president, because people were like, wow, this man can do great things. Yeah. But yeah, the same idea that we can do this through humanitarian and charity work, it doesn't work during the Great Depression. Great Depression. It's too big, yeah. So yeah, history has not very been very kind to Herbert Hoover, but he did the good stuff too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did the school have much presence in Minnesota? Yes. When I was doing research, I found that at 19, like the beginning of the school year in 1918, schools were shut because the flu was such a problem. Um, and somebody just informed me, another history professor, SMSU, said a student a couple years ago, an undergraduate student, actually did her whole research project on just this area and how bad the flu was. 
And contrary to popular opinion, it hit rural areas just as hard as anywhere else. Um, this is a paper that probably deserves a little bit more attention, need to find it. But yes, it was a problem here too. Bigger than you would even think. Mr. Crude. Uh, what about, did they roll bandages? Did they have yes. that they rolled bandages? Yes. <laughs> they made bandages, they rolled bandages, they made bed sheets. So it's not just knitting, it's sewing too. And in bigger towns like Marshall, there would be sewing days and knitting days. In smaller towns, it was just, just come. You know, we're open on Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just come. Any other questions? No. Well, thank you all for coming. I love to talk about history, and I'd talk if there were two of you in the room, but when there's 70, it's even more exciting. So thank you for coming. Yeah.